Welcome. My name is Mika Fex, and today we're going to be studying the fifth lesson of the Cornerstone Connection for the first quarter 2024. Now on the set, we have our wonderful team, Shamala, Omweri, Subira, and our wonderful teens teaching. On the sign language, we have Joyce, and on the orchestra, we have Subira playing the clarinet. Now, I'll be going through the mission story, so please, let's go through it together. The title is Once Poor, Now Rich. And it talks about a five-year-old girl named Amita. Now, Amita lived in Nepal, and her family was very, very poor. The family was so poor that they couldn't even afford to give her breakfast, lunch, or supper. They couldn't have money for cabbage, rice, or even some little potatoes. Now, when the cold came, the family was so poor that they didn't have enough money to even buy her some warm clothes, some wool socks, some boots, and a warm jacket. So during the night and during this winter period, she will freeze and just hope for the summer to come quickly. Now one day, the mother left home and left the father and Anita all by themselves. Anita was very sad and she never saw her mother again. Father didn't like living without a wife. So a few months later, he married again. And the new wife came with two children. Anita was so happy. She was so happy and wanted to please the new mother. However, the mother and the father loved the other new children more than Anita herself. She will be the last person to serve food. She will be the last person to get the warm clothes during winter. And she will always be the ones doing chores. The little ones and the other children did not do anything in the house besides get very treated, treated very nicely. Now, when Anita was eight years old, a neighbor told her parents about a Seventh-day Adventist orphanage that cared for children who had no parents or our parents who could not take care of the children. Father and mother took, looked at each other and loved this idea very much. And without consulting Anita, they quickly took her to the orphanage and left her there. Now, moving into a new place was scary for Anita. And, but the good thing is she quickly adapted and started to like the orphanage and the activities that were going on. She liked going for breakfast and lunch and dinner. She liked having warm clothes during the cold season. And she loved going to Sabbath every, going to church every Sabbath. Now, she's never gone to church and she's never about, heard about this God. But six years have passed since Anita moved to the orphanage and today she's very happy. Once she was poor, but now she's rich in Christ. I am very thankful to my Heavenly Father who brought me here, she said. If I were not here today, I would not have known God. No, now I know who my Savior is. She's studying hard and hopes to help other little girls with difficult childhoods one day. I would, I would like to help people like me in the future, she said. So I ask you to pray for me. I want God to use my life for his purpose. May his will be done in my life. Thank you for your prayers. Part of this, 13, part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help establish a school where children like Amita could study uh, in Nepal. Thank you for planning a generous 13th Sabbath offering.
welcome to our lesson today. The title of this lesson is Confessions of a Foolish Wise Man. Confessions of a Foolish Wise Man. Is it possible to be foolish and wise at the same time? It's something that we'll explore even as we study this lesson. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce the panelists who will be here with me. And I'll start from my left hand side. Please introduce yourself. My name is Omweri. Okay, thanks. Hello, my name is Shamala. Hello, my name is Sabira Kundi, and I'm happy to be here. Yes, welcome even as we study the lesson. Before we start, I'd like to invite Shamala to offer a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this day thanking you for the gift of life and for the gift of this gathering. As we're about to discuss this lesson, we pray that you will speak through us, that your spirit will dwell with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our, our reading for today uh, will be from the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. And it reads, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or a sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. We'll move ahead to our what do you think section. From number one, meaning it's the most important reason, to ten, the least important, why do you think people find confession and repentance difficult to do? I will begin by asking Teacher Nico to define the terms here, confession and repentance. Okay. So confession is when you know you have done something wrong and you acknowledge that you have done wrong. So the realization comes to you that whatever act that you committed is wrong. Then repentance is turning away from the wrong act. I remember when I was young, sometimes my parents find me in trouble. Then I say, I will not do it again. But interestingly, I end up doing the same thing. That is not repentance. Repentance is actually when we confess and say, we know what we've done is wrong. Then we say, because I understand that this is wrong, I will not do it again. So that's how I define the two terms. Oh, wow. It's similar to an understanding of like confession being I know what's right, I know what is good, and then repentance is living out the good. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll begin by sharing my number one reason mm -hmm. why people find it hard to confess and repent. I think that is, they don't want to stop what they're doing. Um, as much as outside voices and influences such as our friends may tell us why would you really choose to do that? Is it such a big deal? The decision to repent or confess lies with us. So if we really don't want to do that, then we won't. Um, Omeri, what did you give as your, one, as your number one reason? I agree that most of the time it's because people don't, they, they don't want to continue in sin. And I think that combines with that they don't believe they'll be able to stop committing the sin. Because you can confess, but then you feel like at the back of your mind, you know you're going to do it again. So you wonder mm. what's even the point of confessing. Mm. And I would say it's not, it's not good to continue in sin, but God's grace is enough. And for example, the Israelites, they sinned many times but God still forgives them again and again. Right. I think, well, that the reason why people find confession and repentance difficult to do is because they feel guilty. I think what sin does, it just puts you in this alternate reality. And once you continue doing it, you feel as though what I'm doing is it's nature. It's what I'm doing. It's not... Um, bad at all. So you sort of switch off this um, 
conscience. And I think of conscience, conscience as spiritual pain that tells us you need to stop doing what you're doing. But once you continue doing sin, that pain is sort of numbed. It goes down. So I think that guilt that they feel is that if I truly confess and I repent, I'm telling myself that what I'm doing is wrong. And it just gives you, it doesn't give you a pass to continue doing what you have to do. So, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, the thoughts there are actually quite interesting. And if we think about it, repentance is made easier when we confess. For example, if you're a thief and you need to go and confess to someone that you're a thief, that is really, really hard. Turning away from it is easier done after you have confessed it. So that's why confession and repentance normally come together mm -hmm. because you can't repent from something which you don't even acknowledge uh, that, wrong. yeah, is wrong in the first place. Right. So I'd like to highlight something that is important because there's an area that sometimes we feel that we won't be able to stop doing this thing that we are repenting from. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, Christ who strengthens. strengthens me. So it is Christ that helps us to be able to repent. But confession is something that it's us who have to do. The Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So God is good to us and gives us the power. So if we try turning away from sin ourselves, you can try it and you'll end up failing. But if you do it with God, you'll be able to turn away from it completely. Yes. yes. Amen. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Mm -hmm. So the next question, can you take us through that, Shamala? Um, okay. I think Teacher Nico has clearly pointed out how confession can bring us closer to God. Mm -hmm. When we do something wrong to someone and acknowledge it, the next step is typically, how do I get on their good side again? Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we accept our wrongdoing, uh, to God, we will most likely be urged to take steps towards correcting our wrongdoing. And I think confession, when done enough times, leads to repentance. And that's our whole life, really, because we as humanity, um, with the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we went through this period of just falling out of relationship with God. And the whole idea of confessing and repentance is really defining what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. Because we have to confess daily to the sins that we continually commit. Mm -hmm. But our repentance is working to live Christ-like and leading our lives in a way that is sort of imitating the way Christ did. So his example on earth is to truly show us what repentance is in full light so that we can get back to relationship with God. Do you guys think that there is any connection between pride and the unwillingness to confess? I think that there's a connection because when you're proud, you're more likely to, to see yourself as right or to justify the things that you do. So then you won't see the need of confessing as opposed to being humble, then you'll know that, you know, you're sinful in nature and you'll confess easier. In teens class, we're exposed to a form of prayer. It's called ACTS. A, that stands for adoration. C, that stands for confession. And T, for gratitude or thanksgiving. And S, for supplication. It's super important, first of all, to adore God, to praise him for the things that, you've, that he's done for you. But confession is a very crucial element. With prayer, it's important for us to have humility, to bow down our head, to be in utter awe of what God has done and what he will do. And when, it, when we confess, just like your question, it's very difficult for us to do that because we have so much pride in us. What we did is not as bad. So why is God punishing us for it? And why do we really have to confess? So that pride really does come as an obstacle to our confession, our repentance, and restoring that relationship with God. Yes, amen. We can move on to the next section. Yeah, sure. 
So we've learned a lot about confession and repentance from the what do you think section. And as we continue talking about the confessions of a foolish wise man, we want to see how confession actually took place in King Solomon's life. I'd like to invite Subira to actually take us into this story to actually understand what led the wisest man to be foolish and what did he confess after? Absolutely. So God gave Solomon great wisdom and a very great insight as well and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sands on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than all the people in the east and all the land of Egypt. So in Ecclesiastes, he says, I said to myself, come now and I will test you with pleasure to find what is good. But that also was meaningless. So King Solomon was greater in riches and in wisdom than all the kings of the earth. So that the whole world sought audience with Solomon. But he also writes that wisdom is better than weapons of war. And that one sinner can destroy much good. There's an evil, he says, I have seen under the sun, the sort of error that arises from a ruler. That is, that fools are put in the highest of positions, but also the rich occupy the low positions. He reminds us to remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come. And it's a whole poetic paragraph that says, before you say, I find no pleasure in them, before the sun, the moon, the light grow dark, the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble, when strong men stoop, when the grinders seize because they are few. And when people rise up at the song of the birds, but all their songs grow dim, then people go to the eternal home and mourners go about their streets. We must still remember him. But it comes down to this statement. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Now all that has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Mm -hmm. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Amen. It's a really powerful story here, um, and we're really told that the Bible emphasizes Solomon's great riches and his wisdom, but still he does foolish, de foolish decisions in his life. So my question to you is, how is it that the wisest man in the whole world could make such foolish choices in life? I think... Uh, the answer lies in the question itself. Wisest man, human, human weakness and fleshly desires can lead us to act out of character, can make us do things that people would not likely expect of us. And I think that's, that's where Solomon fell. Okay. Thank you so much for that. In fact, the title itself that we're really talking about is confessions of a foolish wise man it's a paradox foolish wise man what do you guys think about the title i think it's contradictory in nature because it's hard to be foolish and wise at the same time and it's interesting that solomon actually is referred to as a foolish wise man and in relation to the question you asked i think sometimes we might become foolish even when we are wise because the bible says in jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23 let not the wise man glory in his wisdom and let not the mighty man glory in his might and let not the rich man glory in his riches solomon had everything the riches and the wisdom were all his and as a result he gloried in this not recognizing god as the source so that is the way that we can actually become foolish while wise. You have everything, but you lose it. So the title is actually interesting because of the nature of its contradictory self. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when someone has so much, it's mm. very easy for them to become prideful, mm. in the things that they have. But now we're really taught that he confessed. These mm. are the confessions of the foolish wise man. 
And what does Solomon's repentance teach us about God? Okay. I would say that the fact that God was able to forgive Solomon after he had spent probably decades living in sin, worshipping the, the gods of his wives, I think it shows that God is very forgiving. Mm. He can He can forgive you for what for you know your sinful nature. And it's important to remember that just because he forgives us that doesn't mean we should continue living in sin. Mm. Absolutely. That time of reflection is necessary. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, and I also think that God gives us long life even as we consider how long Solomon was given to live. God did not say that now because you have done this, your kingdom will end. He had the chance to live his life and see the results of his sin. And thereby he was able to repent. I can imagine if God was to kill us for every sin that we did immediately, no one would ever even have a chance to repent, right? So we actually see the grace of God in his dealing with Solomon. Yeah, so I think uh, that's something interesting that we can look at. So, uh, Shamal, I'd like you to take us through some of the interesting things we find about what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12 about the life that, what happens at the end of life. This is in the Monday section. Okay, so here we can um, match what... Solomon says to mm -hmm. the elements of aging. Mm -hmm. For example, the grinders cease because they are few. Mm -hmm. That refers to teeth rot and fall out. Yes. Those looking through the windows grow dim. I think that refers to our falling eyesight. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what he was trying to point out is that nothing will stay the same forever. And therefore, we should appreciate that which is here now before it loses its meaning. And we can continue by uh, reading through the key text, which comes from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. And it says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask the panel, what do you think remembering your creator in the days of your youth means? Okay, so I think um, we as teens, we are really aware of this. Youth is determined as a really critical period of harvesting our faith and our belief in God. Um, therefore, even Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, I believe, um, talking about train up your, the child in the youth, and then when they grow up, they will not depart from it. It has great truth in our lives. And remembering God, the remembrance of God at a time like this, where our values, our belief system is truly shaped, is very important. Because then, once we grow up, we have this solid understanding and trust in God, despite the struggles that we go through. And I think adulthood is really a teacher of um, life. And I think teacher Nico can testify about that. But really just talking about how in, when we're younger, it's a beautiful time for us to grow our faith so that when we are older and we're facing these challenges, we're more, we are certain that God is still with us. Yeah. Um, Mary, any thoughts? I would also say that Many people think that they can live for the world as they are young and they'll commit themselves to God later in life when they grow up. And over here, Solomon was trying to teach us against that. Because when you do that, the longer you stay in sin, the harder it's going to be for you to get out of it and live righteously. And when you're in sin, you're also missing on opportunities to help other people to do what God would want you to do. So we need to we need to use our time in our youth well. Mm. Amen. Amen. Remembering your creator in the days of your youth is actually so key for us because when we remember our creator, it helps us to make the right decisions. In fact, the Sabbath was given to us to remember creation. 
because in six days you shall labor and do all your work, but in the seventh day we rest from all our labor. The reason we rest on Sabbath is because we remember what God did in creating us. And it's particularly important for us when we are still young because the decisions that we make right now will determine what we do later in life. Someone shared with me something interesting, which I think I should share. And it was basically a saying that states, a good decision is a bad decision if there is a better decision to make. A good decision is a bad decision if there is a better decision to make. Yes, and the term creator really mm -hmm. speaks so much because at this time mm -hmm. of social media where we're exposed to lifestyles of people really quickly, mm -hmm we sometimes lose our own identity mm -hmm. and our identity in Christ and God. So once we remem remember our creator and who he is to us, mm -hmm. it's really easier for us to live and exist in a world that's so quick. And mm -hmm. um, I think that term creator can really speak to teens today. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so we'll move ahead to a flashlight section, but before we do that. Uh, Umwiri, could you read Matthew 6, verse 24? And as you read that, you can share with us the flashlight of the lesson today. Matthew 6, 24 says, mm -hmm. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Mm. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is riches or wealth. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we move to the flashlight. Mm -hmm. The flashlight says, by his own bitter experience, Solomon learned the emptiness of a life that seeks in earthly things its highest good. Yet the Lord forsook him not. By messages of reproof and severe, severe judgment, he sought to arouse the king the realization of the sinfulness of his course. Solomon's repentance was sincere, but the harm that his example of evil doing had, had wrought could not be undone. Though the king confessed his sin and wrote out for the benefit of after generations a record of his folly and repentance, he could never hope entirely to destroy the baleful influence of his wrong deeds. The the question in Tuesday is how can you not get caught up in earthly things that many teens get caught up in? Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to contribute? I think we can do that by constantly tapping into what the Lord says, reading our Bibles constantly mm -hmm. can help guide us even when we feel like we're about to fall. I would especially like to share a verse that I find quite encouraging in Galatians 6 from verse 7 to 9. And it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I think here, Paul is very clear. It is, you do right, you get, you get good things. No. You do wrong, the end is inevitable. No. And therefore, we should stick to that path of constantly trying to do the right thing. Doing that which the Lord expects from us, and we will rip a good harvest. Amen. So, Barry, do you have any thoughts there? No, I think she said it beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important for us to keep account mm -hmm. of the things that we do, um, good and bad, because then um, it makes confession, it makes repentance mm -hmm. much easier. And yeah. Amen. Amen. I would add that one of the ways of not getting caught up in earthly things is to involve yourself in heavenly things, mm -hmm. to, to involve yourself in like the work that God gives us, whether you're volunteering at church or you're helping out at mm -hmm. a hospital, just it's good to keep yourself busy because mm -hmm. the devil, 
he likes an idle mind. Mm-hmm. And when you're busy, keep yourself busy with God's work. Amen, mm-hmm. amen. Yeah, we, we shouldn't let uh, ourselves get caught up in every other thing the world offers and God's work is actually left languishing. I believe it's in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 2, where the Bible says we should set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. So when we set our affections on things above, then it so much more determines uh, what we do in our life. And that comes close to what it means to remember our creator. Because if you're thinking about God constantly, chances of getting involved in some of the things that are mentioned here that led Solomon astray is hard to actually come by. Then uh, still, is there somebody who wanted to add something? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, then Omeri, I'd still like you to, you to read something else from, actually, maybe Subira can read it. Matthew 16, verse 26. Then Omeri, you can yes. help us to understand what are some of the aspects from Solomon's story that we learn about. This Absolutely. And this verse is a, one of the punchlines, mm-hmm. um, my favorite, actually. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 26 reads, mm-hmm. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Mm-hmm. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Um, wow. I really like this verse as well. Um, and then where of course, is going to go after. But I would mm-hmm. like to say that the soul is so immensely precious, mm-hmm. a gift from God. And in this world, it's very easy for people to say selling your soul. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very um, disrespectful, I would say, to come from that point of view when the Heavenly Father, our Creator, has truly given you this ability to live, Mm -hmm. a chance to choose the right thing to do, a chance to choose Him. So I think having the whole world is very meaningless. As Solomon goes on to say, he's lived and done that. Mm -hmm. He has all the riches. He has all the wisdom. What more could he ask for? Mm -hmm. And still in that point and having everything, he realizes that there's, it's not much meaning. There's not much value. And he encourages us, just like you said, to look on heavenly things, Mm -hmm. to look on things that are of eternal value. And I think that's important. I would add that when we were created, we were in communion with God, when Adam and Eve were created. Mm -hmm. And then sin came into the world and, you know, we were separated from him. Mm -hmm. So now there was a space that was left, you know, in our heart. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's a God-sized hole and you can put all you want into it, you know, money or power, and it will never be full because God is infinite. So just, yeah, you can never be fully satisfied with the things of this earth because we weren't meant to be satisfied by them. Mm. Another thing we learn from Solomon's story is that the gaining wealth on this earth, it might feel good, but then it's only for a very short time Mm. compared to eternity. Even if you live an old age like Solomon did and you you know you still have money up to your death it's nothing compared to how much time you could spend with your father in heaven so just focus more on the eternal than the mm. the things of this world Amen Shamala is there anything you can learn from Solomon's story I think uh The greatest message I received was pointed out in the flashlight Mm -hmm. where Ellen says, Yet the Lord forsook him not. By messages of reproof and by severe judgments, he sought to arouse the king to realization of the sinfulness of his course. Mm -hmm. God's grace is endless and his mercies are new every morning. Mm -hmm. And as much as Solomon had been given everything Mm -hmm. by God, he was led astray by the things of the earth. But God did not leave his side. Mm. God continued to teach him and show him that his path was the only one that was right. And it's the same thing that the Lord does to us now. Mm-hmm. As much as we may be wrong, it doesn't mean an end of anything. It doesn't 
break our relationship with the Lord forever. He always wants us back. Yeah, so that's what I got the most. Amen, amen. So, Sabira, could you take us through the punchlines? Absolutely. So these are verses that really speak um, to the lesson at hand, but equally things that we can apply. My favorite, of course, was mentioned before, mm. Matthew 16, verse 26, mm. in treasuring our soul, but in the same way, um, not desiring things of this world, but looking above. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask, what verses do you really speak to you guys? What verses are your favorite? King Omiri, go first. I would say that my favorite might be Hebrews 10.24. Mm -hmm. And let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another mm -hmm. and all the more as you see the day approaching. This, the day approaching, of course, is talking about Jesus' second coming. Mm -hmm. And here we are being encouraged to, to spur one another, to push one another towards good deeds. And mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons we come to church. Because when you're standing alone, of course, it's possible for you to do good. But then when you're in a community, you're going to, it's going to be easier for you to continue on the path towards heaven. Because when you make a mistake that you might not even notice, then someone else can help you and guide you along the path. Amen. Amen. Yeah, for me, uh, the verse I liked most was Psalm 62 verse 10, where the Bible says, Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. And the part that speaks to me most is this last part that says, Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. I believe this is a verse that in principle is basically saying, as your blessings increase, it is not for you to think about how much you have been blessed. Because the moment you start thinking about this, then you lose focus on the one who gave you the blessings. So that speaks to my heart because it tells me, be thankful to God for the blessings you have, because it might go just in one day. So appreciate the blessing every day. Don't act like you now have it all. I really like what Janiko has said, and I think that is why it is important for us, especially in our younger days, to establish a good relationship with the Lord so that when uh, we establish riches or other greater things, material things in the future, we are not led astray. We are still in the path the Lord has set for us because we had a strong relationship with him to begin with. Yeah, um, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, I think, like you said, material things, and I think I've heard one, so someone say before, I'm not sure who, but <laughs> materialism is cured by content and willingness to align with the will of God. Amen. So I think that's something, a food for thought. Amen. Amen. So as we close the lesson for today, uh, I'd like someone to read Proverbs 16, verse 18. Anyone has it? Proverbs 16, verse 18 and 19. Yeah, whoever gets it first can actually read it for us. Yes, Proverbs 16, <laughs> okay. verse 18 and 19. 18 and 19. Mm -hmm. And it says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Mm -hmm. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed mm -hmm. than to share plunder with the proud. Mm. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 18 that wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Father goes on to say in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. What I'm reading are the confessions of Solomon. Then again he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 5 and 6, 
there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceeds from the ruler, holy is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. The meaning of the word holy is a bad choice or a bad decision or a foolish choice that is made. So Solomon was saying that he has seen a great evil under the sun, and that is holy is set in great dignity. That is, the wrong things are esteemed to be the right things and set in a high place, such that foolish choices actually look good. And that's why Solomon is making his confessions. As the ruler of Israel, he made many wrong decisions such that when people looked at him as the ruler of Israel, they were like, if the king can do that, then even I can do it. Solomon was at a high place, and he therefore ended up misleading the nation. And it's interesting to know that many times they went into idolatry. From the book Prophets and Kings, we're told, from such examples we should learn that in watchfulness and prayer, is the only safety for both young and old. One may for many years have enjoyed a genuine Christian experience, but he is still exposed to Satan's attacks. In the battle with inward sin and outward temptation, even the wise and powerful Solomon was vanquished. His failure teaches us that whatever a man's intellectual qualities may be, and however faithfully he may have served God in the past, he can never with safety trust him, his own wisdom and right. integrity. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I'd like to invite everyone to share their closing thoughts. Start with Subiru. Absolutely. All that has been said is amazing. But mm -hmm. my last remark would be that confession is only brought to God's full attention mm. when seasoned with reflection and realized by repentance. Amen. My takeaway for today is that the Lord does not forsake us. Even when we go wrong, he will continue to bring us back to his light. And therefore, we should not let our sin burden us. We should not let our sin make us feel like we're not worthy of God's forgiveness because he's always there to take us back. I'm worried. Okay. Yes. And it's good for us to confess the things that we need to confess because we don't have all the time remaining. We don't know when we're going to die. In fact, if we can confess our sins as early as possible, let's do it. Let's not wait our whole life to actually confess to the whole world like Solomon. Let's do it when we notice it. We're doing wrong. I'm weary. I would say that we should we should be aware of when we are sinning because sometimes you can't sin and then you don't you don't even know. So try it by reading the Bible, of course, and think about what you've done that day. Think about the reasons behind why you're doing it. Mm. In Solomon's case. He might have been looking for peace or pleasure, which is not entirely wrong. But then now the, the ways in which he did it was the wrong path. So just be aware of the reasons behind why you're doing something. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us for the lesson today. Those were the confessions of a foolish wise, mind, wise man. And it's up to us to determine if we are wise or foolish. And I'd say that wise men confess their sins. Foolish men do not. I'd like to invite Shamala to say a closing word of prayer for us. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven, we thank you for our discussion today about the confessions of a foolish wise man. We pray that your revelation to us today will lead us to a place of confession, that we may acknowledge our sin and walk towards correcting it. We thank you for your endless grace and your mercy, and we praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We'll meet again next time.